Today we would begin to discuss the state formation in Maharashtra and in Rajputana. There are similarities and dissimilarities in the formation of the states of Maharashtra and Rajputana. First we would see Maharashtra and then we would see Rajasthan or Rajputana. In Maharashtra, the principal architect was Shivaji, as we all know. Shivaji's ancestor, Babaji, was a patel or a headman of a small village in Pune district. Some of his relatives were employed in Dolotabad. Then his successors, one of the successors, Shahaji, he began to emerge as an important figure during the time of Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar granted him a land in Kolhapur, which was then held by Murari Pandit of Bijapur. But Shahaji ousted Murari Pandit and joined Bijapur and became one of the Maratha chiefs there. But this uh, alliance, or rather this submission to Bijapur, did not last very long as the Mughals were approaching the Deccan. Actually, the history of the Deccan is very much tied with the history of the Mughal advance into the Deccan. And we would see that Shivaji took full advantage of uh, this Mughal advance into the Deccan, the conflicting interests between Bijapur, Golconda, Shibaji and the Mughals, this had helped Shibaji to a great extent. After this, the Mughals had taken over Ahmad Nagar. And after taking over Ahmad Nagar, they imprisoned Nizam Shah. Shahaji then became the champion of Ahmad Nagar and he was helped by Bijapur to a great extent who sent him a force. Shahaji conquered much of the territory of Ahmad Nagar districts and many of the Ahmad Nagar nobles joined him. He found a prince of the Nizam Shahi dynasty and made him the king. His force was then about 20,000 and his revenue was nearly 1 crore rupees, which was almost equal to those of Bijapur and the Mughals. This did not, however, last very long. In 1632, Fat Khan, the son of Malik Ambar, joined the Mughals, and the Mughals granted Fat Khan the district of Pune. This had angered Shahaji very much and he had joined Bijapur to take his revenge. But this alliance between uh, Bijapur and uh, Shahaji also did not last long. Shahaji tried to join the Mughals. Shah Jahan gave him uh, a mansab, 5,000 Zat, 5,000 Sawar. But this also did not last very long. So this was the uh, really the interlude before we come to Shibaji's uh, career. Shibaji, who was living with his mother Jijabai, in the fort of Pune, had conquered some of the areas, some of the hill forts, and after the release, he conquered the very important fort of Javli from the Maratha chieftain Chandrakant More, from where he got enough treasure and goods, etc. With this, he began to recruit the Mavli foot soldiers, the infantry, 
Maratha infantry, so to speak. And with this army, he began to conquer the different hill forts, including the coastal Konkan areas. Now, this was becoming a difficult uh, for Bijapur as well as for the Mughals. But the Mughals were then far more involved in the Central Asian affairs and did not really interfere. After the death of Shahaji, Shivaji began to conquer other areas from 1657. But he soon realized that with Bijapur on one side and the Mughal on the other, it would be very difficult for him. So he asked negotiation, started negotiation with the Mughals and asked certain forts as well as the port of Dabal and certain other areas. Aurangzeb was not willing to give him that much. By the time the civil war between Aurangzeb and Dara was over, Aurangzeb had become victorious and during that time Shivaji had conquered many areas including the areas of Bijapur and certain ports like Kollan. These ports are important to Bijapur because the exports of Bijapur pass through Kollan and the Portuguese used to bring the war horses from foreign countries to these areas. Therefore, Bijapur decided to attack Shibaji at this time. The attack was to be spearheaded by one of the premier nobles of Bijapur, Afzal Khan. Afzal Khan, a veteran general of Bijapur, came and invited Shibaji for a conference. Obviously, his idea was to kill Shibaji in this meeting. But Shibaji was also prepared, and there is no need to repeat the story of how Shibaji had killed Afzal Khan in the meeting. During this encounter, the troops of Bijapur, without a leader, were scattered, Shibaji could easily seize all the goods and treasures of Afzal Khan and he became one of the legendary heroes of the Marathas. Many Maratha officers, many Maratha troops joined him. Even the Afghan mercenaries of Bijapur now deserted Bijapur and joined Shivaji. This was the time when Aurangzeb decided to strike. His first act was to send Shaista Khan as Viceroy of the Deccan. Shaista Khan, with a huge army, occupied Pune, made it his headquarters, and gradually began to spread towards the Maratha territories. Shivaji now realized that a frontal encounter with the troops of Shaisa Khan would not be feasible for him. So he decided on a bold stroke. On a night, he with his very few bodyguards and trusted lieutenants went incognito to Pune entered the bedroom of Shaisa Khan without any problem and attacked him. Shaisa Khan managed to escape, losing one finger on the process, while his son and some of the women of the harem, they were killed. Shivaji then left the bedroom, left Pune, and it was stated that there was some treachery because he was challenged by the guards of Shasta Khan, 
but Shivaji was not seized. Whatever the reason of this, this made once again Shivaji the hero. And this time Aurangzeb was very much angry. Meanwhile, Shivaji had decided to attack again and he plundered for three days the unwalled, very rich port of Surat from where he got nearly treasure of one crore of rupees. There was a Killadar at Surat, but the Killadar and the governor of the city of Surat they did not have good relation and since Shivaji did not attack the fort, the Killa, the Killa that did not advance and Shivaji plundered with heart's content for three days. Now Aurangzeb now decided that time has come to do something different. He appointed Jai Singh, Mirza Raja Jai Singh, one of his trusted princess as viceroy of Deccan, Jai Singh did not underestimate Shivaji at all, unlike his predecessors. He first opened the diplomatic negotiations with some of the Marathas who were hostile to Shivaji and with Bijapur, although Bijapur did not commit anything. But the Maratha Saddas who were hostile to Shivaji were ready. With this and with a huge force of 12,000, Jai Singh marched to Pune, captured it almost without a fight, made it his headquarter. But then he decided on a very bold course. He decided to attack the center of Shivaji's strength, the fort of Purandar. In this fort, Shivaji had kept his family as well as his treasure. Jai Singh now besieged the fort of Purandar very closely and the Marathas tried to dislodge him but failed. When the fall of the fort was imminent, Shivaji began negotiation that led to the Treaty of Purandar in 1665. By this treaty, it was agreed that Shivaji would surrender 23 out of 35 forts to the Mughals. Secondly, he would pay 1 crore and 20,000 rupees to the Mughals in installments as war expenses. Thirdly, Shibaji would be allowed to conquer as much territory of Bijapur as possible with the help of the Mughals and Shibaji would retain these ter territories to himself. This was a very clever move by Jai Singh because he planted a discord between Shivaji and Bijapur. Bijapur, however, remained silent and Shivaji was not very happy either. He had to surrender so many forts to the Mughals. The Treaty of Purandar was not liked by Aurangzeb at all. He did not trust Shivaji at all. To him, Shibaji was a very treacherous person and he would not keep his promise. Aurangzeb was not alone in his doubts. Jai Singh's chief lieutenant, Dilir Khan, was against it. As a matter of fact, he had advised Jai Singh that first let us throw Shibaji into the prison and then we'll attack Bijapur. Some of the other chiefs of Jai Singh also were of the same opinion. So when Jai Singh proposed a march on Bijapur, 
along with Shivaji. Shivaji was half willing, but still he wanted to experiment. But Aurangzeb was in doubt, and he did not give Jai Singh further re reinforcements or any heavy guns. Jai Singh arrived at the gate of Bijapur but could not break through because he did not have heavy artillery. Shivaji attacked Panhala fort, very strong fort of Bijapur, but could not take it. Immediately, the party hostile to Shivaji counseled that Shivaji should be imprisoned because he was a traitor. Jai Singh now found that his scheme was falling through. So he proposed to Aurangzeb that let Shivaji go to Agra where he was staying and let Shivaji talk to the emperor and they would find a solution. Aurangzeb agreed, advanced one lakh of rupees for the journey of Shivaji. Shivaji agreed also on a safe conduct given by Joy Singh. And Shivaji arrived at Agra. And at that time, Aurangzeb was celebrating his birthday. And there are so many celebrations that Aurangzeb did not have the time to talk to Shivaji. He was asked to be in the Darbar, where he was uh, put in the category of 5,000 Mansabdas. That made Shivaji very angry. He said that his son Shambhuji was getting the Mansab of 5,000. One of his relative Netaji was also getting 5,000. And he has been made a 5,000 Mansabdar, which is below his dignity. So he walked off angrily from the Darbar, which was a gross violation of the Mughal code. And he was immediately imprisoned, actually house arrest. Aurangzeb wrote to Joy Singh, asking for his advice, telling him of what had happened. Joy Singh suggested conciliary treatment. But before Joy Singh's letter could reach Aurangzeb, Shibaji has escaped and had returned to the Maratha country. How did he escape it is a very well-known story and need not be repeated here. For two years after his return, Shibaji remained silent. Then he asked pardon in writing to the Mughal emperor who pardoned him and gave a mansab to his son Shambhuji, 5000, with a jaigir in Berar. That jaigir was suddenly taken away by the emperor to compensate for the one lakh of rupees advanced to Shibaji for his journey. This was the excuse that Shibaji was looking for. So from 1670 on onwards, when Aurangzeb was busy in the Afghan uprising in the northwest, Shibaji began his conquests, and this time in the territory of the Mughals. One after the other fort was conquered by him. Meanwhile, Shibaji had understood that he must have his back properly secured. So he made an agreement with Khawas Khan of Bijapur that he would not invade Bijapur territory and Bijapur will not arrest him or stop him. At the same time, he made an understanding with Golconda. There were two Hindu ministers then at Hadavad, Madanna and Akanna. And Shivaji's agreement was accepted. Shivaji went to Golconda. He was given a very royal treatment. 
and Golconda agreed to pay him a subsidy of one lakh of rupees annually, as well as forces, to invade Karnatic. With this money, Shivaji went to the south and went up to Jinji, conquered Jinji, which was to later became a refuge of his son, as we would see. And he left Santaji Ghorpare there of an extensive terri territory in the south. Then he returned to his, to the Maratha country. And this was the major uh, expedition of Shivaji. Meanwhile, in 1674, Shivaji had declared himself a king of the Marathas. There was a coronation ceremony presided by the priest Ganga Bhatt, who declared Shivaji as a high caste and high class Khatriya. Shivaji took two titles. One is the protector of the Hindu Dharma and the second one was the jewel of the Khatriyas. Meanwhile, Shivaji had once again attacked Surat and once again got plenty of money. So with all this, with the coronation behind him, with a large country of Maharashtra, practically independent, Bijapur in agreement, Golconda in agreement, Mughals were distant, Shivaji died in 1680. With Shivaji's death, the situation changed to a certain extent. But before we go to that, we see a little bit of the administration of Shivaji. Shivaji's general administration was modeled on that of Mali Kambar, whom he always respected. Now, he made a, the council of ministers, Ashtopradhan, eight ministers, with Peshwa, the prime minister, as the minister of finance and general administration. But there is a difference between this Ashtopradhan and other council of ministers. These ministers were not collectively responsible. They were individually responsible to Shivaji. There were the Vakyanavis, the intelligence official, who also looked, uh, looks after the household of Shivaji, the Sanapati, the Majumda, the accountant, and so on and so forth. These Ostrapadhans, all working under Shivaji and under his instruction, wanted to resume or start the measurement of land, which was done in 1679. But before that, Shivaji has organized his army as well. His army now, 40,000 cavalry and about one lakh of foot soldiers. Significantly, and unlike those of the Mughals or other Deccan states, Shivaji's soldiers were paid regularly in cash. Shivaji did not like to pay their salaries in grant of land. Although Shahaji had started like that, but Shivaji did not entertain it, excepting one or two occasions, Shivaji's forces included what is known as Silahodas, that is auxiliary loose troops. Marathas hired for particular expeditions and then they were disbanded, again brought up in the next expedition. The plunder was part and parcel of the Maratha army. 
but the plunder was accounted for. It is not a personal booty of the soldier. Every plunder has to be deposited to the state, then it is to be distributed. No soldier can take it. It is a very strict one. Strict discipline was maintained. No woman or dancing girl was allowed to accompany the army. At the same time, Shivaji organized one of the very few Deccan states, his flotilla of boats. It is called Navy. But Navy, as we know in modern parlance, is different. Navy is hierarchically arranged. There is a superior officer, higher officer, and so on and so forth. In the flotilla of boats, there is not that much of hierarchy. There were gunboats, 60 to 100. There were also the trading ships. And Shibaji used, ships used to go to trade in, in Middle East, in the, in the, partly also in Southeast Asia, which was not a very great trade, but it continued. His principal rival was Siddhis of Janjira, who sided with the Mughals, as well as the Malabar pilots, most of them Muslims. But Shivaji managed to get the Muslim Malabar pirates to his side. He recruited his sailors from the Kohlis and the Vandaras, the local Marathas, and they did well. Now in this total organization, Shivaji's emphasis was that the Deshmukhs almost like powerful Jamidas, they should be controlled. The slightly later witness, Shabhashad, said that the Deshmukhs had become very powerful. They are actually becoming a rival to the Maratha state. So Shivaji now form, began to form regulations for the control of the Deshmukhs. He allowed their certain privileges, allowed the Jamidas also certain concessions, but their rights were curtailed and thereby they were reduced in power and authority. But the final portion of his administration is the revenue system which we would see next day.